about the life cycle of your disposable car. Especially after you just enjoyed the same cup of coffee. When I do something in the crash, I frequently start to think, is this really going away? Or is it simply occupying a different space out of myself? Am I being responsible? By not questioning my habits? How many people across the globe are doing the same thing as I am right now, over and over again? My name is Maria Marcos. I am a contemporary jeweler and have been teaching the art of transforming waste. For the past four years, to industrial and graphic designers in my hometown in Mexico. I am here to challenge your assumptions about the power and beauty of everyday physical objects through my art In 2007, I was fortunate enough to attend the design school. At that time, I was a 29-year-old graphic designer with an insatiable hunger for learning and discovery. As you can imagine, coming from a graphics background did not make me the most skilled jeweler, as my tool set and experience were the most limited. On my first day of class, my peers and I got assigned the task of making 100 frames in one week. Yes, you heard me correctly. 100 different things in one week. Which translates approximately into 14 to 15 things to make per day. Can you imagine the pressure you get from such a challenge on your first day of graduate school? It was intimidating to say the least. Since they, there was no time to spare, I started thinking how to tackle this epic test. But then, a freezing idea stopped me. Did our professor expect us to make 100 rings from metal? I had learned some basic silver smithing techniques back in Mexico, but I was nowhere close to my peers in terms of proficiency. Once I had exhausted the ideas of how to make 100 rings and perform all of them, I did what every desperate art student would do in a situation like this. I ran to the school store. <laughs> if you have an appetite for making, you can understand the feeling of entering an art supply school. It is given pleasure. I wandered every single aisle of a very well supplied school, looking for something that would give you the possibility of becoming a ring. At first, I sourced those materials from the art to my graphics background, like paper or carbon. But soon enough, my levels of desperation escalated, and I started building things from whatever I could find in my studio bench. Pipe cleaner, hot glue, uh, plastic tubing, anything that could be then or fold became a ring. They stayed passing by, and even though I was diligent in making, by day five or six, I was already in a frantic state, as the materials and ideas ran out. So I went to the and started considering things that I never thought could be used as jewelry materials. On my walk home, I picked up some colorful folders from the road. The aluminum foil for my chewing gum, why not? And then I reached my final state, stretch. When I saved the orange video from my lunch, only to dry it out later in the shape of the ring. I ate rings, I drank rings, I obsessively saw everything through the lens of a ring by the end of the week. I failed to report that I did not make it to 100. But I got very close. However, I went through the assignment with all I had to do. And that accounted for something. And as a matter of fact, it did. This was my very first connection to what is known in the contemporary jewelry field as alternative or found materials. Given that, I had no idea that contemporary jewelry could be made from absolutely anything. During my time in grad school, I was constantly challenged 
with the same question. What does it mean to be a Mexican artist living in this fundamentally cold northern environment where most days go by in shades of gray? My energy was taken by the heaviness of the longest season there is in New England, that is winter. As a result, I dedicated my time to the research of color, thinking through the effects of its energy on a diversity of psychological and physiological responses on the body. I became color obsessed by making objects of adornment that could serve the body as a means to counteract the beautiness that had overtaken my essence. Using the brightness and the warmth of my country made me search for ways to be a tribute to the life I was missing. Two years later, and many words and color studies in between, I came up with my thesis entitled Color Infusion. A collection of sculptural objects that took form by taking hundreds of them in gradients, radiating the energy of color onto the body. In, two, in 2010, I returned back to Mexico. I had been seeking an employment opportunity, but the 2008 economic downturn made it impossible for me to stay. So there I was, back home, completely taken out of context, facing a similar identical question. Who am I in this new, yet paradoxically familiar environment? But most of all, how am I going to survive in a country financially and artistically, where my discipline has close to no recognition. Up to these days, the amount of opportunity for development and dissemination of the field are quite limited. Mexico is a country defined by an abundance of its silver smithing traditions, but there's only a few who devote their lives to the development of concepts and ideas that communicate a message to an audience regardless of the material. The lack of an artistic community in my hometown and the financial challenges of surviving as a an artist triggered the momentum for this life project. Soon after uh, graduating, I started looking into my belongings for possibility. I needed to create regardless of my financial situation. I noticed that I had been saving two beautifully craft paper bags for my local food store. And as I was looking at them, an idea struck me. What if I made a necklace from them? I rapidly reached for one of my paper bunches. And after a while, I had enough material to thread my very own first purchase necklace. I believe that when you want something so badly, the universe inspires in your favor. At some point after my return back home, I received an invitation to teach contemporary journey at my former college, Universidad Cristal de Fene. The class was addressed to industrial designers and the subject was sustainability. From that moment forward, I have been able to share my largest passion while at the same time giving my two cents to the contemporary jewelry field in Mexico. But the best part is that I get to do this through these objects that have been slowly captivating my perception since day one in graduate school. I have divided the creative process of transforming race by identifying four different roles. The first one, I call it the catalyst. In this space, I rely on the captive minds of my students to become immersed in what I call a brain rewiring session through images of contemporary jewelry made from the purpose materials. I spent countless hours confronting their assumptions about usability and potential material wearability. But what does it mean to make a work of art for the body? What are the details involved in its craftsmanship? On the second row, we have the hunter-gatherer. 
Going out in the world and collecting objects from different environments is central to this process. Looking into our own habits and the things we use and despite on a daily basis is almost an immediate urge. But it's just as important to collect objects from near and far surroundings, like the coffee shop, the young girl, or a factory. All this can lead to unusual and interesting findings as to which materials are more available and abundant. On a third row, there is a map of scientists. Once a large collection is, is gathered, the objects are scrutinized and separated into different materials, such as paper, plastic, or fibers. To be then grouped into the categories according to their specific qualities, such as color, shape, or variability. It is also important to furnish your research with a proper framework about the origin and the use in context of the three chosen materials. These three steps set, set the groundwork for the transformation of the material, which leads us to the fourth role of the magician. How to tackle the transformation of a plastic bottle or an old magazine? At first, the process is driven by intuition. Can you rig the material with your hands? Which is the right tool to work with tape? Can it be woven or sewn? All these questions find their answer through experimentation. But what's most important here is to fully understand the nature of your material. Only then will the magic happen. And by magic, I mean that moment when you're so exhausted and frustrated of trying to make the material fit into your design paradigm that you have nothing left to do but to let go of your expectations. One of my students, Daphne, she chose to work with video tape from EHS cassettes. She has performed one of the most challenging and exhaustive process of transformation that I have witnessed in my teaching years. No matter what she did, the tape just wanted to roll, and every single time ended up on a messy pile on the floor. She wanted so hard to control the tape, until one day I just asked her to stop and play freely with the material. The activity became so physical that she ended up covered and tangled in it. And from that point of experience, her chaos vest, also known as coffee, came to life. From here on, a flowing and honest process of dialogue arises between the maker and the material. A jewel is defined in the dictionary as articles of silver, gold, or precious stones for personal adornment. This definition falls too short in my world. But what makes an object's work worth? How does it impact our perspective of preciousness, beauty, and value to see pet bottles or videotape purposely becoming part of an object of adornment for the body? Gravitating towards the remains of our everyday life has been an effort to find my voice as a jeweler, but also about making myself sustainable in the process. Nurturing the habit of collecting familiar objects that represent a significant role, yet commonly overlooked in the common sense, commonplace, has taught me not to underestimate the power and beauty of the ordinary. Coffee cups along with their sleeves and sleeves, empty medicine blisters, toilet paper particles, and the list goes on. It is said that you can learn a lot by looking into someone else's trash. And you sure can tell by now that I was part of a student. I don't consider teaching a job. Every single time I put my heart out and I do my best to convey to my students my utmost devotion for the art of transforming waste materials into extraordinary works of art. I don't expect them to fall in love with art or contemporary children. I just want them to become passionate 
about something in life by committing to a challenging creative process, but also to understand that any object can be contagious if they put their minds and hands to it. The extraordinary happens if we commit ourselves to see it through. Every day, we engage with dozens of different objects that serve a functional purpose in our lives. We use them for what they are intended, and then we toss them away. But do we ever stop and think if they deserve a second chance? Does your takeout or food container be reused, repurposed, or recycled? In his book, Herbology, Edward Kuhn describes how we generate 47 pounds of trash per day. Reconsidering our habits is becoming more and more crucial if we want the future generations to live and breathe in an enduring world. But for that to happen, we need to redefine our understanding of waste in relation to usability and necessity. Do we need to buy a 24 pack of white wash? Or can we refill our own when we're thirsty? And what about that printed paper? Can we save it in a digital format? What I mean is that we don't have to become activists or environmentalists to contribute to an enduring world. We're all born makers, and creative living is not just for those who go to art and design school. It is a way of living, and it is available to everyone if we care enough to open up that door in our lives. Let's think how we can challenge uh, notions of disposability in our home and our community and engage creatively in this way. I chose to spread my message to art because this is what I am and what I do, but also because art has contemplative qualities that set the mood for pondering ideas in personal meaning. Thinking back to my first project assignment in graduate school, I had no idea how profoundly this, this assignment was going to impact my perception of the world for the rest of my personal and professional life. By sharing and teaching the art of repurposing waste, I have forged a synergy that has gone, by, has gone beyond my expectations. A couple months ago, I was approached by Fast Company magazine for an interview. They published an article about the work they do with my students by transforming trash into jewelry. This wonderful opportunity has propelled my message beyond the classroom, and it is probably why I'm here today sharing with you my love for finding beauty and passion in all of uncommon and disregarded spaces like the trash can. Thank you.